Welcome back. I guess welcome back to us as well. Hopefully you've seen my shareholder notice I sent out last week where I touched on some of the reasons we were limiting our communication through social media as well as our shareholder notices. And it really comes back to company structure, the status with the OTC, SEC, and FINRA. We elected about five years ago to go under the protections of a Form 15, which just allows us to function more like a private company. And the concern with some of the transactions we were negotiating with, the topic came up a few times that we may be being a little too aggressive in what would look like marketing activities for a company that is currently in the process of kind of resubmitting itself and relaunching itself to the OTC and of course the public market. That being said, there is a public market and we have to be aware of that. And so we decided to just take some caution. And over the last few months, I've worked really closely with the board and our legal counsel to establish some guidelines about what we should and shouldn't talk about and at what time we would start to release certain information. So this is kind of the beginning of that transition back to the ways of old. I'm glad to be back in front of you guys. Um, I think most of you know this is actually one of my favorite parts of the job and it was a goal of mine when I took over this company to offer up leadership and a business model that was extremely transparent to our shareholders and other investors that would be looking into our company both present and past. This is a really great preview of what's to come and a real nice snapshot of, of what we went through last year. So I wanna jump right in and just talk about the challenges we faced. You know, we had a couple of difficult things to deal with and one of those is just the general cannabis bottleneck. I think if you haven't worked in this industry before, you would be surprised that there are so many additional steps with cannabis that you wouldn't even think of. And that comes down to local regulation, additional oversight by the banks and merchant service platforms, website providers. There is no limit to who puts us through additional hurdles to get to the finish line. So that really was the theme of 2019. For every step we had, there was a setback and it was all progress. And I think it's stuff that's really, really important for us to have addressed and cleared last year. growth capital. We raised some capital. We really deployed that in an intelligent way. I think everybody sacrificed on the team where they needed to sacrifice. And we were extremely thrifty with the budget, but we had some success drawing in new tenants to the farm and making farm improvements. Um, so much success in that we really didn't have enough capital to fully build out all of the landing pads for these new licenses to set up operations on. So we were having to balance the opportunity against the cost of setting up the initial infrastructure infrastructure. And that was definitely a challenge. And I'll talk about that more in a little bit. But as we grow, I don't think that theme is going to change. And that's also part of our 2020 plan is to expand and partner with institutional investors that would really give us the tools necessary to expand and grow at scale. One of the other challenges, of course, is just the constantly changing regulation. Just as a quick point of reference, when we have a rule change in the Liquor and Cannabis Board in Washington State, well, we've got multiple products that are licensed into that state as well as processes that include our standard operating procedures and everything that goes along with that. And when something as simple as a color change in the packaging occurs, not many people realize that doesn't mean we just go to our logo and drop the red or make a quick swap. What that means is redesigning the entire logo and design, not just for that product, but each and every flavor of products that are made under that skew. And then you've got to factor in there are three different sizes of quantities that those packages come in. So it's a complete package redesign. It's a complete logo redesign and effectively what may look like on paper three to five products or core SKUs actually represents about 30 or 40 different packages and designs. Those regulation changes have big impacts on our operations and the operations of our partners. There were local changes that required us to go back and reevaluate all contracts between any, any partners out at the farm and our parent company. That included the leases, the service agreements, um, any consulting agreements we had. And those all impact our go forward projections and pro formas when we take a look at what the collective group of companies uh, looks like and how it impacts our financial statements and our future forward-looking statements. So there's a lot of impact there. And I know that most of you are really savvy and you understand that there are always gonna be changes. And that's really my specialty and the specialty of my team is deep understanding of the Pacific Northwest rules and regulations and how it applies to a company like ours. But 
the amount of changes and the ripple effect from, from one thing to the next causes these lags and delays. And so I appreciate the patience. I can tell you it was one of the biggest challenges of 2019, if not the biggest challenge. But the last big challenge was banking and merchant services. And that was another huge pain for our group. I think all of you who've run a business, or I guess even you at home with uh, just a traditional account, understand the importance of having steady, convenient banking services so that you can cover your bills, pay your expenses, actively monitor and track funds as they move around. And in this industry, you'd be surprised, even at this current stage of the game, how difficult that can be. It was particularly difficult for Greenlink because we aren't a licensed entity inside of these regulatory frameworks, so we actually don't have the same oversight that a licensed marijuana producer would have. So the banks that deal directly with them here in Washington State use a lot of the regulations that are in place by the Liquor and Cannabis Board to vet these companies. We're a different animal altogether in that we work very closely with the industry, but we actually don't sell marijuana. So we don't fit into that box and we don't fit into the box that is traditional banking services. So we were on the hunt for what seemed like forever to find a bank that understood who we were, what we wanted to do in the long term, but also understood that we were going to operate in close proximity to the cannabis industry. So that was a long process and we finally got that squared away. I'm really proud of the banking relationship and respect what OB Credit Union is doing for the industry. I don't think they're getting enough credit. I think their willingness to go out on a limb and really, really work with the industry and do it with a smile on their face is such a, such a change from what we're used to. It's been such a long, kind of a 12 year history for me of, of battling banks who will do business, won't do business. So the back and forth with banking has been such a nightmare that I'm, I'm just really proud to have a partner like OB who's really supporting us through this journey. On the flip side, there's merchant services. And that became a huge problem for us because every time we rolled out a uh, marketing launch for our CBD line of product, we would see a change in merchant service rules, which would effectively eliminate our ability to process payments. That merchant service issue was something I was deeply concerned and took up a lot of our bandwidth focusing on because so much of our marketing efforts would be wasted if we weren't able to fully process accounts. So we're just now to a point where we feel confident in our merchant service provider and don't have risk of doing a big advertising and marketing campaign that would somehow leave us holding the bag on, on tens of thousands of dollars worth of orders. So just to recap, you know, the cannabis bottleneck really took its toll on us this year. Growth capital, regulation changes, and banking all kind of slapped us around a little bit, but I feel like we came out the other side of it and uh, we've resolved those issues. I feel really confident that our team is, is stronger. The reason why there's such hope in all of this is because the state of Washington is probably the most, there's no probably about it, it's the most overregulated market in the industry. So it's truly a scenario where if you can make it here, you can make it anywhere. And so our contracts and applications of our growth model kind of this proof of concept really translates well to every other state in the union. I think going through all of these processes and developing these plans in a way that we have is really, really healthy for our long-term growth. The farm expansion is probably one of the things I'm most proud of this year. And I certainly am not the one that should be taking the credit for it. There's a crew out there that was tasked with managing a large scale commercial garden and heading up the expansion for future pads and new tenants to come out and join the party out there. That was such a big task. I think we were, I shouldn't say I think, we were certainly underfunded and undermanned and we laid miles of fencing. We put up miles of security wiring. We put up so many cameras and established the foot print for new licenses to come out. The challenge was we were trying to get all of that done last spring to be ready for a full harvest this year to come down. And that proved to be a taller task than we could pull off in large part because of the changing regulations at the Liquor and Cannabis Board. We would get these licenses set for transfer and then we would go through an administrative process with uh, licensing, with enforcement. And there's so many other steps that have to be addressed in the process of transitioning out to our land 
that this process sometimes takes three to six months, it's actually taking closer to two years now. We're excited because of course, uh, it's gonna be a sight to see. I'll just leave it at that. We look forward to executing on our end and getting all of those licenses released and fully active in the spring so that you guys out at the farm who have busted your tails to get everything ready will be farming on all of the licenses. And we expect to have a total of about a dozen licenses before 2020 is over. So the farm expansion, guys, I can't say it enough. I'm, I'm honored to have been a part of it and watched you guys work the way you did. And for those of you that haven't seen it, when the snow melts and the, the spring comes and we really start getting all the greenhouses up, there'll be lots of aerial photography done and uh, it's really gonna be a sight to see. So that's probably one of the things I'm most proud of in, in 2019. One of the other big things in 2019 was establishing our standard operating procedures under this new company structure. As I touched on a couple times, there were so many regulation changes and so many rule changes that we had to then go back to the drawing board and figure out, well, how can we contractually obligate these partnerships to provide our products at scale and uh, collect revenue through those agreements without violating these new rules and regulations? And at the same time, how do we keep our packaging and our products up to date with the new rules? So just consider how many ripple effects occur when they change a recipe or they require a certain product can no longer be used or testing changes for a certain product. We have to then go back through the entire standard operating procedures and then provide our partners with new SOPs to execute and deliver our product to our liking. So that was a bigger process than I think most would think as well. Our production manager who's been with me for eight, nine years now, and I spent a lot of time together this year back out in these facilities, touching up on recipes, making changes to packaging and redesigning, and then working closely with the design team and the marketing teams to figure out how all these pieces are gonna fit together when we make these small changes. So there were really no small changes. I, I I'm really proud of how much effort that the team put in and where we're at with our standard operating procedures, and that includes everything from administrative management all the way down to product creation there is a constant updating of our operating procedures because that's effectively what we are. We are a collection of people with a lot of experience and we've itemized that experience in each of our marketing tools in a way that we can scale and move into new markets quickly. So there was a lot of time spent on that and I think our standard operating procedures, not just from an organizational standpoint, but from a functional standpoint, are better than they ever have been and they are the most scalable version of S. SOPs that I've seen in the industry. So if I was going to hang my hat on, on something relating to our products, it's not to argue that we have better products than our competition. It's not to argue that they're stronger, they're more consistent. And our ability to scale when we're consistent is unrivaled. So I'm obviously very excited about that. The next one, of course, I touched on a little bit was just banking and merchant services. I won't harp on this, I'll be quick. OB has been a champion for us. I'm really excited about the relationship. Merchant service platform for us and our partners at realcbdforme.com has finally stabilized. We are going to launch aggressive marketing campaigns in 2020. I'll touch on that when we get to the 2020 objectives. But the banking and merchant services thing, I think I would feel like I've overlooked a huge step if I didn't chalk that up as a major victory for us in 2019. Lastly, this one is a bit of a touchy subject. This has been a hard fought battle by both sides. And when I say battle, I don't mean fighting with each other. I mean, in the sense that we've both been working really, really hard at this. We have the historical financial statements of the company that were resting in Canada that were a result of a lot of different business activity over a long period of time that resulted in a large carry forward tax loss. We love a tax credit. A big part of our, orig our original transaction was built around this large tax credit that the company was sitting on. We needed to reconcile all of that information, get it down to our CPAs and let our accountants really dig into it, merge that with our current financials and all the forward looking statements statements of the company and as we go before the OTC with the intent of saying, here's who we are, here's who we have been, this is our business model and this is how we move forward, this is who is in charge and how we're going to reconcile this going forward looks like this. As a part of that process, we wanted to have 
all of our ducks in a row. I feel confident that we now have ourselves in that position. We're sending everything back up to Canada for a final review. And then of course we will present this to the OTC. So I know a lot of you have been waiting a long time. There's a lot of talk about the restriction, a lot of talk about moving out of the form 15 and getting ourselves into a position where there's a lot more reporting going on in the company and getting the restriction removed so that I can actually start marketing the uh, success of the company and build a market for our stock. So I'm really excited. I know that that's a frustrating point for a lot of you. It was wildly frustrating for us. And I believe we are within a month or two of turning over all of that documentation and getting ourselves back to a strong position within the OTC. So those are kind of my, my short list of highlights from 2019. Of course, there were thousands of other developments. We acquired a lot of new assets. The Suncliff brand, I love that so much. Uh, the response and feedback from establishing our footprint in the THC and CBD markets has been so overwhelmingly positive that I'm certain once we're in a position both financially and framework wise within the OTC to actively market ourselves, we're going to see widespread success. Twenty twenty, we're going to call this the year of execution. We're going to execute and build on the foundation that we've put together for the last twelve years, and really, really build on the success we had in twenty nineteen. The first order of business, of course, is getting the financials submitted to the OTC, sitting down and working through any issues that may remain from historical transactions of the company. And really, I don't see many. I have I've hired people to independently review the company and its historicals and there's no major issues that we see that are going to get in the way of removing that restriction. Some of the things that we're working on now to really finalize are working closely with the transfer agent, making sure that all share issuances are taken care of, all documentation is in place for employees that have either received employee options or foregone salary for the purposes of drawing in uh, the maximum stock that they can, effectively investing in our project, getting all of those things in a row, making sure all the deals are finalized and in place in such a way that there's no confusion or misunderstanding when we go before the OTC. So all of those relationships are being firmed up and finalized so that there are no question marks that remain there. And I feel confident that in the first quarter of 2020, we're going to have all that documentation submitted and be well on our way to removing the restrictions. So that's something obviously we're all looking forward to. After we get the financial submitted and the restriction is removed, I'm really, really looking forward to marketing this company. Not just marketing the company for the purposes of driving attention, but marketing the success and the new developments of the company in a way that drives value and builds a reputation for us and our brands. So that'll include being more active in trade shows and getting back in front of the camera and doing things like I did historically, the NBC Nightly News and World News Tonight and things like that. Like getting in front of large crowds and talking about our company, of course, will we'll bring an audience and be very impactful. So I'm really looking forward to that. I think that's one of our strong suits and something that uh, historically we've had a lot of success with. So I look forward to that as well. One of the other things we're gonna be doing a lot of in 2020 is fundraising. We have large capital investment pools that are available to us that are really offering some aggressive terms that would help us expand and grow, but we're trying to be really intelligent with how, when, and how much we bring in capital because there's so many of us that have put in a lot of hard work and we don't wanna get into a situation similar to our neighbors up north where we're forced into a scenario where our revenue streams don't justify our market cap, our revenue streams don't justify our operations and we're forced to continually raise capital at the rate of hundreds of millions of dollars in some cases. And when you've got operations like a lot of the guys up north that are losing 20, 30, 40 million dollars a quarter, you have no choice but to be in this continual state of fundraising. And we want to be a little bit more intelligent about it and deploy funds in a way that drives revenue and limits our need to go out and immediately borrow more capital. We'd like our growth capital to be exactly that, growth capital, not packed holes in our existing operations. So we are going to target these kind of two, five, 
five and $12 million tiers so that we can intelligently raise money and preserve as much of the company and drive value for our existing shareholders um, and maximize for all of us that are involved. And of course, we understand that we're going to have to bring in some large capital pools to, to scale globally, but we feel confident with the strategy we have in place that we can build a national audience for our brands and services. So that's a big part of 2020 is establishing that. We've got a number of partners we've already spoken with just kind of kicking the tires and you guys will see more and more activity relating to fundraising as we get to a point with the OTC where we're free and clear to go out and do a lot of that. Next up is probably my favorite topic of them all, and that is the process of building a national audience for our brands. Suncliff, as a brand in the CBD market has the ability to market itself on a national scale, and we have partnerships with realcbdforme.com, 420beast, and a couple of other partnerships in the works for brick and mortar distribution. So as we develop all of those outlets and all of those marketing strategies and deploy them, you're going to see the awareness of our brand drastically increase. We'll also be marketing the Pubco and the success of those campaigns as well. So you'll see this kind of hybridized branding that's that's going to be brought to the masses that'll include Greenlink's story and a highlight around its brands and services that it's providing. So I think that's going to be a result, of course, of the capital that comes in. A large part of, of the capital deployment is going to be on expansions out at the farm and increasing our productivity as well as finalizing our partner partnership with a company out of California that will take the bulk of our manufacturing off of our hands um, in 2020 to allow us to scale. And effectively, what we'll do is utilize our resources here in the Pacific Northwest, which is the laboratory, the kitchens, the production and processing facilities. Those will become proving grounds for new products and new products we're developing and have been developing for a number of years now to be launched. And then fulfillment will be done in California manufacturing facility that will be using all of our standard operating procedures. So we're going to outsource some of the manufacturing so that we can scale operations and really focus on brand awareness because that's the big race. Heading into 2020, when we see this paradigm shift in the political landscape, it's going to be about who has the audience and the attention of the consumers. We want to focus on that while the barriers to entry are still relatively high and access to that audience is um, very much available to us. That's one of the things I look forward to most over the next 18 months is really really seeing where the brands can go and how well received they're going to be in these new markets. So last but not least is the farm expansion. We will continue to expand at the farm. I see no reason to limit the amount of tenants we can bring out and the revenue streams that we can create through these relationships. So we're going to continue the farm expansion as well as deploy funds from our capital raises to improve the overall production on the existing licenses. So we've got the ability to convert some of these farms to light deprivation greenhouses, which effectively takes us from one annual harvest on that pad to three and in some cases for annual harvests. And of course that drastically increases the production and drives value through all channels in our network. But we also have a situation where that expansion allows for our team to really stay focused year round. I think I'll just close by saying, hey, I apologize for how long of a rant this has been. I look forward to taking a few more steps and putting ourselves in a position where we can talk more openly about the financials and getting our quarterly reports in so we can talk about the developments of the company. And that's what's really going to open up the door for these institutional investment strategies, as well as building confidence with us and our shareholders. I'd like to remind everyone here that most of the shareholders of this company have been around for 10, 15, and in some cases, 20 years. Um, most of the new shareholders 
in this company are people that either came with me as part of our original deal or friends and family who have uh, chosen to participate because they see some of the opportunity that's available to us. So I'm really excited. The core of our group is really uh, is a tight knit group, both from the corporate side as well as the shareholder side. So all of you that have been supporting the company and watching along this journey, I really appreciate everything to the staff and the team that's just doing all of the work, the hard stuff that no one really wants to do. I want to thank you guys all from the bottom of our hearts, especially here at the executive team. Those of you that are at the farm and putting shovels to dirt and in the production facilities and in the extraction labs, like big thank you to all of you. I really appreciate everything. I hope that uh, this opportunity is something that you're excited about too because we couldn't do it without you. So I think it's safe to say that every time we sign a new contract or close a new deal, we're breaking new ground both on a national level as well as a, a local and regional level. And we're effectively blazing a new trail. And it's one of the things I enjoy most about this opportunity. So I appreciate the opportunity to sit in this chair, play this role. And I look forward to a more open communication dialogue with all of you sharing the success of 2020 and let's see what we can put together i really 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 am excited so probably a couple too many reallys but that's the truth anyway i hope everyone has a great day and i look forward to talking to you again soon take care